Good morning, and we are in uh, Proverbs chapter 24, and we are beginning this morning in verse 11. We are in the midst of the wise sayings, and this is wise saying number 25. It's, uh, I guess, uh, we had a little bit of a cold front come through early this morning. It was 55 degrees in Oklahoma City this morning. So uh, we are getting the changing of the seasons, and John Calvin calls that providence, not seasons. General providence, predictable things, special providence are miracles, or what we call or classify miracles. Proverbs 24, beginning in verse 11. These are some very, very technical and some of the most difficult Proverbs uh, of the entire book here. Uh, Deliver those being taken to death. Your translation may have and or even. Hold back those staggering or you may have stumbling and being led to slaughter. And then here's a further explanation. Verse 12, For if you say we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs motives discern and that we would supply in English the truth? It's not really in the inspired language. So I have uh, two responsibilities to expound. One, I have to tell you exactly what the text says, and also I have to make the text clear. So we add the truth because it is implied here, but that is not a part of the language. As for him who protects your life, does not he not know? And he will not, will he not repay a person according to his conduct? A very, Intricate proverb here. Uh, 26, we are skipping. Why saying 26? It's an exhortation to wisdom. Verses 13 and 14, we have had so many exhortations to wisdom, so we will skip that. And now to 27, uh, verses 15 and 16. Another very interesting an intricate proverb here. Do not lay an ambush as a wicked person against the dwelling place. Now you may have a different translation, but that is the actual word, dwelling place, and it is a word that is rich in understanding in the Old Testament. And we'll get to that. Uh, A wicked person against the willing place, the dwelling place of the righteous, For the righteous person, if he falls seven times, then he rises, but the wicked stumble in calamity. We have two real major interpretive questions with this wise saying. What is it to fall? And what is it to rise? Otherwise, lest, or verse 17, uh, saying 25, when your enemy falls, do not rejoice when he stumbles. Do not let your heart shout in exultation. Verse 18, otherwise, or your translation may have lest, I believe that's the authorized version, The Lord will see, and it will be evil in his eyes, and he will turn away his wrath from him. Very interesting proverb. Uh, Saying 29, 19, and 20, we're going to skip because that is really a repetition of Psalm 37, the beginning of Psalm 37, do not fret over evildoers, and uh, so you can study that. 
from the Psalms, or you can study that from the Proverbs. We will skip that wise saying and move on to saying 30, which is 21 and 22. Another very interesting proverb. Fear the Lord, my son, and the king. With rebellious officials, do not get involved because disaster from them suddenly appears. Who knows what ruin the two of them can inflict? A very uh, difficult proverb to follow there. And uh, so these are very hard. I'm, I've skipped the easy ones and I'm tackling the hard ones. Dr. Johnson would tell us students, if you want to learn how to preach the Bible, preach the hard texts. Don't preach the easy ones. So here I am, finally figuring it out after 50 some odd years. Uh, but these are hard. Uh, one other item before we begin, uh, this is really addressing the social responsibility of a Christian. Now, the church is not a political institution or organization. The church is uh, a conglomeration of the righteous all together, but we have as individuals a social responsibility as individuals. And we're going to address those from the Proverbs. But this is not a, a call to organize within the confines of the church. I remember as a young Christian, I uh, attended a Southern Baptist church once and only time I visited. And, uh, and their, their, the title of the message was Liquor by the Drink. And that's what the whole thing was about. We never opened the Bible once. It was a denunciation of liquor by the drink. Well, that's not what the purpose of the church is. The church is to instruct you in the Word, and then you go out with what you know, with the God-given gifts and talents that He's given you, and you are outside in the confines of the world, and you are applying that Word to your life. And that is, in effect, the skill for living. So, we have these issues in these Proverbs this morning about our responsibility outside the church. So we ask the question, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is, of course, yes. You are your brother's keeper. And to the extent that God creates the providence and the time and the place, because that's what He does. You are your brother's keeper to those who are non-believers. And we'll see that in these Proverbs. Okay, verse 11, deliver those being taken to death. Two striking commands here. Line 1, first deliver. And verse 2, hold back. Uh, for someone who is practicing wisdom, and the skill for living daily, this is the action of righteousness, both to deliver and to hold back. So let's discover what it is. If someone is innocent and being taken for some reason, we should seek to deliver. And many times, that's not our physical activity as much as it is uh, of a call to prayer, to pray that there would be deliverance. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 2. Righteousness, here's your word, delivers from death. That's a great verse to pray for the unborn who are in the womb and need to be protected because they are God-given life. And so, we should be involved to that extent. And if there is a call to greater uh, application to that, then be ready for that. That's the righteous life as I see it. Line two, and or even. I like even because it's a word of definition. 
uh, real clarity here. And here is this second strong command, hold back. Now I'm going to give you the word picture and to this word, and you're never going to forget it. You're just going to have it forever. Because it's in a great text and a great line of Holy Scripture. It occurs in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 12. And of course, Genesis 22 is about Abram taking his son Isaac to the top and slaying him. And so here is our word. Uh, 22, 12, Abram has the knife and he has it extended. And here is Isaac ready to be slaughtered and he's going to plunge that knife into his heart and God speaks. And here it is, 22.12. Do not stretch out your hand against the boy, neither do anything to him, for now I know you fear God since you have not hold back. That's our word. Hold back. We smooth it out and make it past tense, withheld, but it is hold back. That's our word from our proverb. And here it is. 24.11, hold back. The force of the verb, the grammarians say, is power over an object. And so God was exhibiting His power in His word over the object of Abram to hold back from slaying his son. And that's the idea of the verb. Now, look at the end here. Notice the logic. We're commanded to do the greater in this proverb, which is to deliver. So it follows that if we are to do the greater, we can certainly do the lesser. And that is to help those who are struggling. Your text reads something like staggering, stumbling. It's to intervene like the Good Samaritan. Now remember, the Good Samaritan, he wasn't out on a reconnaissance mission. He didn't have a, a Red Cross helmet uh, out. He just stumbled upon this man. And look at the care that he exhibited. Out, no one was calling him to do this. It was all voluntary. But Jesus' example was, this is righteousness. This is what it's like. And so, that's the righteous man who asserts himself in society. He doesn't ignore or pass by wrongdoing. He's placed in this world to be light, salt, truth. We are called to be priests. So organically, what is the job of a priest? Twofold. Organically, he is to keep an open relationship with God at all times. And the second thing, he is to render service to God in behalf of others night and day. Now, we've been called to be priests. So we're priests not only to one another as believers, but to people in the world. Now, here is a closer definition. If, literally for if, it's a cause, a condition of something, it's rational to take control over lawbreakers when we see the innocent in their way. How many stories have we read and we've heard them for years and years, haven't we? About some woman being brutalized and people just stood there and watched. That's Sodom. That's the streets of Sodom. The righteous don't do that. The righteous jump in the middle of it. See, wisdom here is now going to probe our conscience. Look right here at the top line. You say tied to we knew nothing. Is it that you didn't know or you really didn't want to know? Um, now we move from the excuse of line one to the reality of line two. The incommunicable attribute of omniscience. He knows all. He looks straight into your heart. Now look at this. Does not 
it's an, it demands an emphatic answer here to what is required. He who weighs motives. It's literally who, he who weighs hearts. He is looking at your heart. And he is seeing what your real attitude is. John Calvin, the genius of Geneva, there is nothing so hard or firm in a man, nothing so deeply hidden, that the efficacy of the word does not penetrate through it. So here is line three, the protector of your life, by sovereignty, by providence, he watches over you. Line four, the repayment of evil, which is always, and throughout the Proverbs, a certainty. The wisdom of the Bible is simply this. Judgment is coming. It's coming upon the individual, and it's coming upon the world. He is not passing by. He will judge wickedness, and it will be accounted for. That's the wisdom of the Bible. And so we act and live out accordingly to that. Now look at this. Will he not repay? The word means to turn back. It's a, a Star Wars word. The empire strikes back. That's the idea. Turn back. So here it represents divine retribution. It was Joseph's brothers' words to themselves upon the death of their father Jacob. They said, what if Joseph, now that our father is dead, holds a grudge against us? And here's our word, turn back. That's it. We, we have translated that into English as pays us back. What if he pays us back? But that's the word, turn back. For all the wrongs that we did to him, of course, Joseph didn't do that. Joseph practiced hesed with his brothers, covenant loyalty with them. He extended grace to them. Do you extend grace to other people? Do they extend grace to you? That's what we should be about. Extending grace to one another. Always forgiving and always counting others better than ourselves. That's the practice of wisdom. So the upshot of this proverb is that God knows all. God sees all. And for your goodness to all, He's going to bless you and richly provide a blessing to you and for you. So saying 26, 13 and 14, we skip. Now here we come to 27. Tied to verses 15 and 16. Do not lay an ambush. The top line is a judgment upon the wicked man. And it tells us this by addressing the fool's behavior itself. Look at this opening command. It's in the negative. Do not. Now, look at this. Lay an ambush. It's the actual phrase that we had before in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 18. That was when the companions of the wise child, by peer pressure, seek to recruit him into criminal activity. Look, they say, we can lie in wait. Well, that's our word. Lie in wait is the ambush. The same word that we have here. So they try to entice by peer pressure to become a criminal. It's the idea of attacking an innocent person. That's what's going on in an ambush. Look at this word against. That is the hostility aimed at the dwelling. 
The place of the righteous is the dwelling here in the proverb. Now, let me speak about the word dwelling. Great word found throughout the Old Testament everywhere. There is a physical aspect to dwelling and there is a spiritual aspect to dwelling. Here, it is the physical aspect. And what do we know about that from the Old Testament? Well, let's think, for example, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. We know it's the Traveler's Psalm. And What's the psalm about? Well, it's about God's good blessing over your affairs. He watches over you. Now, this is going to come back up in the Proverbs that we're studying this morning. So I'm laying the groundwork. Proverbs 121.3, this is the covenant name, the name of the burning bush, And He, by divine providence, is watching over. And how does He do it? Why, the psalmist says, He doesn't even slumber. He doesn't even sleep. Why, He's not like a man. He never gets tired. He watches over the righteous diligently, He tells us. That's what He's doing. Now, here's the warning. Do not plunder. The word means to assault violently. And you're not to assault violently the resting place of the righteous, his dwelling. Let's talk about resting place here for a moment. It's the location of flocks in Genesis 29.2. It is actually the den of the lion in Genesis 49.9. It's where the lion rests and sleeps. What is the picture that we are being drawn into? It's that the righteous person is never hostile to anyone. Last time we were together, I talked about the illustration of Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. He was in the region of Gerar, and he opened his father's wells, and the men of Gerar would plug them. And so he would move out, and he dug another well. And then they confiscated them, stole the well which is a capital offense in their world. But what did Isaac do? Did he fight? Did he sue? No, he just moved out. And he dug another well, and they confiscated that one. And so, what did he do? He moved out further. Until he got to a place where there were no hostilities. And he said, You remember that word, God has made room for us. And that was the word room is the word that's used in Proverbs for the skill or the gift of the man makes room for him. So it's it's a place of peace and it's a place of adequacy. But here's the underlying thought that you may miss in the book of Genesis chapter 26 regarding Isaac and his behavior. See, it's one thing if I have a company and I have four trucks and uh, I'm in a bad neighborhood. And so I say, I've got to move out of this neighborhood. I've got to get to a safer place for my employees. We understand that. We hear that all the time. Matter of fact, it was just announced the Chicago Bears are moving out of Soldier Field. It's too dangerous. They're going to move way north. Uh, But here's Isaac. He is big. He is a a moving city. Hundreds of people. 
now attached to him. So he is, it's the blessing of Abraham. I'm going to make you great and I'm going to prosper you. And that's what you have with Isaac. He's a moving city. Imagine Dallas just moving around. That's what he was. That's why the men of Gerar sought a peace treaty with him. They were, he, he greets them by saying, why have you come to me? You're, you've been nothing but hostile to me. Now, it's one thing to have a small firm and say, I've got to take my people and move. But when you're Exxon Mobil, you don't need to move for anybody. But that's what Isaac did. You see, Isaac was the meek man that inherited the earth. And that's your lesson from Genesis 26. So, let's consider Paul's admonition as it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. Verse 16, For if a righteous person falls seven times, then he rises. What are to fall and to rise? Observe the parallel in line one. The righteous person versus the wicked in line two. Line one, we have falls matching. Line two, stumbles. Okay, several interpretive questions. And it revolves around the two main words. What is it to fall? Well, to fall is not the word to perish. It's not the word to ruin. So, fall is a temporary setback. Very temporary. Peter denied Christ by the warmth of a fire. And yet, a small setback because Peter was the man Christ used to launch the church in just a matter of weeks. See, very small setback. Job, in all his suffering, that was a setback materially. But it was a very short setback compared to his life and how long he lived. David was pursued by Saul. It's a temporary setback. So that's to fall. But what about this rise? And seven times. This is emphatic in the inspired language. So what does that mean? That means that this term occurs before the verb, and then we put a bunch of exclamation points by it. So this is really the message to be hammered home and is emphatic. Seven times. All right, let's, let's deal with this. Seven. It's symbolic. It could be a special sacredness. That's Exodus 23.15, the celebration of unleavened bread, which went on seven days. It could signify completeness, the totality of a cycle. Proverbs 6.31, a thief, if caught, must pay sevenfold. In any instance, the top line clearly shows that it is a temporary period of time. And so we keep that in our mind. And now we move to the conclusion. Then, or and, it marks the consequences. And here's our word to rise. What does that mean? To rise is divine intervention. A complete reversal of fortune. Just like the line of Christ in the Old Testament. It was uh, David and then the torch was passed to his son, and to his son, and to his son. And as you go through history, and you're looking at these kings, it seems as if the light's been put out, the torch is gone, the promises of God don't prevail. But it, they're like the trick candle on a birthday cake. You blow it out, and back it comes. Rise is supernatural. That's the point. It's what... The non-righteous don't have. The regenerating power of the Holy Spirit spoken to your soul and you were a resurrected person. How do we know that? By Paul's nomenclature. You were dead, he said, in your trespasses and sins. He has resurrected you. He has brought you to life. Now look at you. You are risen. And the death of Christ, good. We finished that. We did away with Him. And He's 
three days in the grave, and then what happens? He's resurrected. The power of God is this Word. And if you don't have it, here's your consequences. David, Psalm 18, speaking about the death of his enemies. I pursued them. I overtook them. I, they did, I did not turn back. They were destroyed. I crushed them so they could not rise. They don't have any power. I utterly defeated them. It will not happen with the righteous. What's history about? History is about the redemption of a fallen world and it is the righteous prevailing over wickedness and wicked spiritual forces to the glory of God. All by His power. So the wicked at the end, they stumble. The words used of divine judgment in Daniel chapter 11 translated calamity, disaster, and we say the same thing, don't we? Look what they did to themselves. Well, what, what we have this past week or so, we had some executive for a large corporation throw himself off a building. Look what they did to themselves. We don't listen to wisdom. It shouts in the street. And this is the end result. It's death. David's prayer, Psalm 36, 11, uses our same word. Let not the foot of the proud come against us or the hand of the wicked drive us away. Look how evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. There it is. You're on your own. You have no real power. Now here's the promise of the fall of the wicked beginning in 17. This is, uh, this is essentially a parallel to verse 16. We have a common vocabulary, falls, stumbles, and it would be the same as the previous wicked, the evil one. These are tormentors of the righteous. And let me just say, I hope you have many of them. Now, am I trying to be cute and cavalier in a Sunday school class? No. I am telling you the truth. What are the tormentors of your life? You remember we all grew up black and white television until it turned to color, and we all saw the NASA launches, and the spaceship was locked to the gantry crane, and the gantry crane was giving the spaceship the fuel and the oxygen and the necessary things. All until five, four, three, two, one, and it lifted off. The wicked are the gantry crane to launch you. Now, why do I say that? Because I've studied the Bible. They launch a powerful life. Study the life of Jacob, who were his tormentors, Laban. Study the life of Joseph. Who were his tormentors? His brothers. Study the life of David. Who was his tormentor? Saul. They were essential elements to making this man all that God would have him to be. That's the tormentor. Now, notice we have two temporal clauses in verse 17. When and when. When your enemy falls, when he stumbles, not if, but when. They are allotted just so much time. Don't you understand that? They have all the leverage over you. They have seemingly all the strength over you. But they're allotted just so much time. Because that missile doesn't stay next to the gantry crane. God launches it, and that is to rise. See, He's taking you to a different place. The wisdom here is not the circumstance. I want you to see this. And watch this very carefully in your text, because it's somewhat complex and you could miss it. It's about an attitude here. Let's focus on the attitude, because that's what the proverb is showing. 
Here's your skill. Don't rejoice in their, when they fall. Don't do it. Eh, why? Why? Because everything you are, everything you ever will be, is from the Lord. The power of God. Absent Him, you are nothing. You are nothing. Martin Lloyd-Jones asked the question, do you think you deserve forgiveness? If you do, you're not a Christian. You and I are nothing but the product of divine mercy and grace. Now, in, when I was studying this, the Lord suddenly drew my mind away from the proverb and took me to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. Let me read that for you. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you too may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. I'll explain that verse in a moment. Finally, we conclude the proverb with the word exaltation. It means to rejoice in arrogance. It's found in 2 Samuel 1.20 when the Amalekite came into David's camp thinking he was bringing him good news, the death of King Saul, only to find that it wasn't good news at all. David wept, so did his men. They rent their clothes. They fasted. Now, that's the behavior of David. That is wisdom. And that's what we're to emulate. Verse 18, which is the second half of verse 17. Otherwise, lest we're thinking here, we're pondering the logic, the Lord will see. Okay, here now is the reason and the purpose for the prohibition not to gloat over your foolish enemies that have tormented you. Line one, the Lord will see. You see that word, see, S-E-E? -E? It is a boxcar loaded with treasure. Let me take you through it. It's the incommunicable attribute of omniscience. He knows everything. It's an anthropomorphism. God doesn't have eyes to see. So it stands for knowledge itself. He understands all things completely. To see stands for the consequences of having an arrogant heart concerning the disaster that comes upon your tormentors. And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1.7. Here's Job's personal testimony. Genesis, uh, uh, Job 31. And let me just say, to every man in this room, I hope that you will be provoked to read Job 31 at least once a year. I read it at least once a year. It is the standard of righteousness of this man, and it exhausts me because I can't live up to his standard. I see why he was the exception on the earth for the living God. Read Job 31, but here's 31.29. If I had rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune or gloated over the trouble that came to them, he called that having his mouth filled with sin. The proverb declares it will be evil in the eyes of the Lord. The proverb we have already covered is Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. The six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable, and the first is a haughty eye, thinking that you're better than someone. And so Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Here's line two. Now, really look at this with me. This is very technical. This is a rather surprising statement. And he will turn his wrath away from the wicked. What we see here in those words is the intensity and the scrutiny that he pays to you, not to the wicked. He's, the wicked he knows from afar. They're not close to him. But he pays great attention to you. You're the object 
that he's focused on. So he's looking at you. His concern is you. That you're growing, that you're becoming, you're kinder, you're more humble with your God. See, everything is predicated upon you and not the fool. His eyes, what he sees, predominate the proverb regarding the moral character that is about you. Not the wicked, not the fool. He turns his face away. Literally, that's Malachi 2.6. It's a physical representation that he turns away from the wicked because you have not been proper in your attitude. So here are two wrongs defined in the proverb. First, the wicked man's action. He's wicked. So God's going to deal with him. But here's the second. And this is the important one. The believer's reaction to the way the Lord deals with the wicked. Do you see that? Look again at your proverb closely. He's watching you. The proverb declares that the first action is offset by the second reaction. So let's conclude the proverb by thinking about it this way. And this is what drove me to Matthew 5.44. Do you pray for your enemies? Do you pray for those who torment you? have persecuted you, they have the power. They have the leverage over you. They're constantly there. And as the Lord drew me in my study to think about it, I I had to get up out of my desk and I had to go get down on the floor and I had to pray regarding my tormentors. And I begin to think about them and thank God for them, every one of them. And I got back up and I start to study a little bit and then I'm provoked again to pray. But this is what happened to me. As I prayed, He gave me more and more names and faces and places. More and more people I hadn't thought about, even considered. Folks, I was praying for dead coaches 55 years ago. And then it dawned on me what he was really doing. He was cleaning up my heart. Remember David's words? Psalm 51, his sin with Bathsheba. Surely you desire righteousness in the innermost heart. There were places in there that needed to be cleaned. And he did. And it was such a good intellectual experience because vertically it put me right under the Lord and not under my circumstances, and not under personalities, but directly accountable to Him for the life that He gave me. And now I'm thinking absolutely straight. And what was Jesus' words? You be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So let's conclude this way. Who were the tormentors of Job? His three friends. They called him every name in the book. Unrighteous sinner. You have no character. No real value. And God informed them at the very end. Remember? Except Job pray for you, you're gone. You're gone. So, let's draw the microscope down. Except Job think... Except except Job draw breath, cross his palate, move his mouth, move his tongue, they die.
Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Don't you know what the desires of your heart are? They're God's will for you. And that's what makes you powerful. Job was the man of power over the lives of these people. And His goodness and mercy exceeds the man in all that He was. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you, take advantage of you, talk behind your back. Pray for them. In honesty and sincerity, and be like your Father in heaven. He looks for His children to be perfect and His scrutiny is not upon them. It is upon you. So now, what is wisdom? Live and learn? No. Learn. Then we live. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this good Word this morning to us all that has spoken to our hearts and our minds that we might be not conformed but transformed into the person of our beloved Savior. Thank You for the blessing that is ours in Christ Jesus. For You have given us all power in heaven and earth in accordance with Your will. And we acknowledge that and embrace it today. In Jesus' name, Amen.